coming out tonight uh, is this alternative to the uh, of the last Republican debate of uh, <laughs> the rest of my life. Uh, I'm Chris Brown. I'm a writer from here in Austin. I've got a book called Tropic of Kansas coming out next year from Harper Voyager. Very happy tonight to be back here at Malvern Books as part of our fantastical fiction series that the shop has put together uh, that tries to feature uh, writers of fantastic literature from Austin. And, uh, and uh, very delighted to host tonight uh, Marshall Ryan Moreska, uh, an extremely talented author of uh, epic fantasy and other, uh, 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 other works uh, from here in Austin. There's a, uh, a little known, uh, never used DVD commentary tract that uh, Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn did to the Fellowship of the Brink that <laughs> <laughs> was published uh, in, the, in a literary journal called McSweeney's that some of you may have heard of. And in it, they, uh, they have a really interesting take on the epic fantasy genre that it's really all about drugs. That in the that the Shire is all about uh, growing pipe weed for Gandalf the dealer, and uh, and that Saruman is there on behalf of the people trying to break up this uh, dealer ring. I've often thought there's not enough street drugs in epic fantasy, and I was very excited when I got to read the Thorn of Tentinel. <laughs> That there were street uh, drugs, there was also magic, fantastical universities, fantastical constabularies, uh, mysterious artifacts, uh, and a really exceptionally well-crafted narrative uh, with a, a fantastic setting that reminded me in many ways, a kind of urban fantasy setting, reminded me in many ways of the, the great Fahrenheit and the Great Mouser stories by Fritz Lieber. And uh, uh, just a just a, a great work, and then to see uh, a, a, a writer who I know who can generate that kind of quality of work with the kind of output Marshall can, uh, it, it, it's really outstanding. Uh, Marshall is originally from upstate New York, uh, graduate of Penn State, where he studied film and video. He um, uh, has had a number of short plays produced. Uh, uh, which I'm curious to maybe hear a little bit more about later and find out whether they relate to this work. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his books are with uh, 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 Daw, and uh, he's got three in print right now, and I'm really excited to hear him uh, talk about them and maybe read them some. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you for I hope I can live up to what that, how that intro played me up. <laughs> You get compared to Fritz Lieber right from the back. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I'm Marshall Ryan Moreska, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've not come into this store as often as I should, because I don't come into this part of town anymore as much as I should. I used to, many, many years ago, when this was not a bookstore, but this was a porn shop. Um, and I worked at a pizza shop that was across the street that's now like a fix your cell phone shop or something. Um, so I used to know this part of town and knew how to get everywhere from right here and here. But I, I always thought someday if I was going to write a book, I'd write a book about my adventures delivering pizzas until the wee hours in the morning because lots of crazy, crazy things happen. But instead, I ended up writing fantasy novels where, again, and I try and incorporate a lot of a lot of things that you don't typically see in fantasy novels that are more geared towards urban fantasy, but putting them in a more high fantasy, classical fantasy setting, which was what I tried to do when I started working on this book. Um, so I have three books here to read from. I think I'm going to go with the new one, which is *The Alchemy of Chaos*. Um, this just came out a month ago. Um, so this is the sequel to Thorn of Denton Hill. There are two separate series going on. There's the Thorn series with Thorn of Denton Hill and now Alchemy of Chaos. And then there's the Meriden Constabulary series, which has a murder of mages and an import of intrigue, which will come out in November. Um, and then there's going to be a third series, also set in the same city, with a whole different set of characters. 
and eventually everything's going to dovetail together into some real craziness. But for the meantime, I've got those what I've got working with my publisher. Anyway, in in the first book, Thorn of Denton Hill, the main character is a magic student by day, vigilante by night, who is trying to stop a drug dealer who is responsible for the death of his father and his mother being overdosed to the point where she's in essentially in a vegetative state. Um, and over the course of the first book, he, he doesn't manage to actually stop the drug dealer because he, he ends up in the midst of all sorts of other problems involving magical items and mages that are working with the drug dealer. And so instead of being able to stop the drug dealer, he has to end up stopping those mages and their horrible evil plan. And so at the beginning of this book, he's been laying low for a little bit. And after being thumped by him, the drug ring is trying to build back up from the damage he caused them over the first book. So that's where we start off here. <clears throat> the Dog's Teeth Pub was an ugly atrocity of lumber and plaster wedged in the empty space between the row house and the intersection of Cole and Hester. Bell was amazed that the university allowed such an eyesore to exist so close to their campus, but they never did anything about it. Maybe it suited their purposes, having something so obviously dangerous and disreputable in clear sight. It kept all but the most foolhardy of students from crossing water path. As far as Bell was concerned, that was just fine. Mr. Fenmere felt the same way. Not that Mr. Fenmere couldn't handle some heat from the university, but if trouble came from there, it was best to keep it to a minimum. A month ago, of course, Mr. Fenmere had been talking about getting a toehold on the campus, getting some students to deal for them. Good money to be had there, but Mr. Fenmere hadn't been talking about that at all lately. Mr. Fenmere had been pretty blazing quiet for a while, until a few days back. Nevin's boys had to be brought back in. This wasn't what Bell was supposed to do, not anymore. But he knew he was being punished for the last month as well. If menial roundup jobs got him back in good graces, he wasn't about to complain. Dog Seath was the last loose end, the last of Nevin's dealers. The rest had been brought back in the fold without any trouble. Blazes, they were eager. They needed the coin, they had people begging for any vial of defeat they could get. That was good, drove prices up. People were now playing a full crown for a vial, sometimes even a crown in five. Once things had settled in this part of the neighborhood, then they could keep the prices right there and people would blazing well pay. More money for Bell and more for Mr. Fenmere. That should blazing well make the old man happy again. Bell went in, the reek of stale beer and the filthy people insulting his nose. He immediately decided this was the first and last time he would come in here. Make sure Nevin's boys found somewhere else to meet with him. The place was also extremely dim. Bell wasn't sure if that was an intentional choice or if they simply couldn't afford the lamp oil to light the place properly. He went up to the barman, a rotund beast of a man with a bald head and more scars in his hands than Bell could ever seen. Lendl and Gemt? You mean Lemt and Gendel? the barman asked. Who's asking? man who shouldn't have to come in here to ask. Bell tapped on the bar, making sure his ring was visible enough to the barman. Even a gutter filth barman in a place like this, deep in the mires of Denton Hill, would know that ring and know that only one of Finmere's close men would dare to wear it. Ain't gonna be trouble in here, is there? Bell glanced, glanced around the place, filled with broken steves and facts the kind who could barely make it through a day's work without a dose of a feet, and as many cups of the dog's teeth swill down their throats. You're probably no stranger to trouble. There's usual trouble and there's real trouble, Marvin said. Usual I can handle. I don't need any more real in my place. Shouldn't get any from me, Bell said, as long as I'm not giving any. The barman signaled to one corner where several tables had been pulled together, and two blokes played cards there, surrounded by what could charitably be called the best looking women in the place. That meant they were the only women who didn't look like they were a dose away from life and feet trance. Gentlemen, Bell said, coming over the table, if we could have a moment to discuss matters. And who the blazes are you? One of them asked. You lemt or gentle? Bell asked. The two of them were almost the same guy. Dark hair, scraggly beards, pox and scars on their faces. Burly enough to be scrappers, but not the kind of guys you would hire to be muscle. Lemt, he answered. Bell held up his hand to show his ring and then popped Lemt in the face. Go roll yourself, that's why blazing am. Hey, brother, there's no need for that, Gentle said. Everything's cozy in here. Cozy, Bell scoffed. Two of you are a couple of fools, you know that? Why is that? Lamp said, holding his nose. We were doing fine. Nevin gets himself killed. We didn't even hear proper. We didn't hear anything at all. We figured, you know, Gentle said, we figured Nevin gone. You folks were done with us. It. all clean, you know? I really don't know, Bell said. 
Devin's boys had to sweat for a few weeks, but business needs to be back up and you two are back in business. He took out a small leather journal and a charcoal styrofoam out of his vest pocket. Back, then stammered. He's gonna lean forward. See, we figured, stop with figuring. Bella said, figuring is for captains, not for toughs and scrappers. Yeah, but, Gentle said, with what happened at all, we figured we were lucky to be breathing. Thought we should keep our heads low and keep it that way. What happened, Bella asked. An old man sitting a couple of tables away started cackling. They mean there are a couple of squealers. Shut it, Coop, Lim snapped. You two, Bella said. Now this makes sense. You're the ones who pointed the, who gave up Nevin. He almost said the name. He hadn't said it in almost a month, nor at Fenrir. You didn't know, Gentle asked. He smacked his partner. I told you they didn't know. No, Bill said. We knew some of Nevin's boys had, but he protected who it was. So it was you two. They sure did, the old man cackled. Gentle sneered at the old man, then turned back to Bell. So now you're going to drop us in the creek? No, Bell said. What happens is you two go back to work. You two are going to sell, and you're going to make sure that you're bringing in 100 crowns a week. A, a hundred? Lindel snapped. Can't be done. Each, Bell added. He tallied that amount under their names in his journal and put it back in his vest pocket. You'll do that because Nevin vouched for you, because we need to build up again, and you boys are the ones to do it. He reached under his coat and took out a leather case with feet miles. Not much, of course, just enough to get these two fools started again. You're building up here again, the old man was the one asking. None of your business, Codger, Bell said. The old man was getting on Bell's nerves. He tapped his fingers on the table, making sure the old man could see his ring. Best steer clear. Oh, fine, the old man said, turning back to his cider. You two are back to work here, and you answer to me. We, we can't work out of here, boss, Jim said. You know he knows who we are. If we start selling again, he'll come for us. You're talking about... Bell shook his head. That ain't your problem, you hear? You do what you're told. Lem's hands were shaking. You, you say that, but who will protect us when he comes crashing in here? You know who they're talking about, don't you? The old man asked. Shut it, that ain't gonna happen. I still ain't right when I go to the water closet, Lem said. So what happens when he comes, the old man asked. He got up from his seat, leaning on a cane, and came over. What are you going to do to protect your boys here, Bell, when the thorn comes for them? Bell felt his hand shake. He's not going to, we're, we're not going to, nobody's even seen. You afraid of the thorn, Bell? I ain't afraid of anything, I'm, he realized he had never said his name in this place. How do you know my name? The old man leaned in. Because you're my favorite, Bell. Bell stumbled back, shoving at the old man, who laughed and melted away, becoming someone else in front of his eyes. Wrinkles smoothed, white beard pulled into a sharp, bare chin. Raggedy clothes became a sharp, burgundy cloak and vest. Walking stick changed to a fighting staff. The face was still hidden by a hood, but casting an unnatural shadow that had to be magic, Bell knew exactly who was in front of him. The thorn. Oh, blazes! the bartender shouted. Bell went for his sword, but the thorn moved faster, and with that infernal rope suddenly wrapped around his hand. The flick was raised, the thorn looped the rope behind Gentle's neck and yanked. Bell's fist collided with Gentle's face. Son of a! Ben Gentle managed to get out before he was hit. The thorn drew up his staff and jammed it into Bell's leg, right in the same blazing spot he put an arrow a month ago. Bell crumpled to the floor before he could stop himself. Blaze it, Lim shouted. Somebody get a blasted whistle box! Call the sticks! Sure, the thorn said, swinging his staff around to crack against Bell's head. I come in and suddenly you all want the constabulary. Bell tried to grab the thorn's legs, but he was reeling from the last blow. The thorn had jumped onto the table and pinned Lem to the wall with his staff. The rest of you try to enjoy your beer, the thorn said. I've got no quarrel with you right now. You'll get a quarrel, the bartender shouted, pulling out a crossbow from behind the bar. He fired almost wildly and hit Lem in the arm instead of the thorn. The rope shot out across the room and tore the crossbow out of the barman's hands. I really loathe puns, sir. You're better than that. He jumped off the table, landing on Bell, locking his breath out and forcing him to back down to the floor. While Bell was reeling, the Thor pawned at him for a moment, then sprung back up. The bastard was already out of the way before Bell could do a blast thing to stop him. As for this, the Thor said, holding up the feet case, it's not going to hurt anyone. It lit up in a burst of blue flame and was gone. You're gonna, Bell wheezed out. You're gonna, he struggled to get up onto his knees, standing without a question. The Thor raised up his staff. You'll let Fenmir know that I haven't forgotten him. The staff smashed into Bell's face. The next few moments were cloudy and dazed until he found himself being hauled to his feet by Gentle, the barman. I told you, Gentle said, holding a rag over his bleeding nose. I didn't want any trouble, the barman said. The thorn was gone. Blazes, Bell muttered. He pushed them both away and dusted himself off as much as he could, some small attempt to maintain his dignity. Brushing his hands on his vest, panic rushed through him. 
He checked both pockets and looked back on the floor and at the table. Nothing. His journal was gone. Fenrir was going to have him for lunch with this. Ooh. <laughs> so that's how that one starts. <laughs> so we have time for, for